this is Bitcoin's monetary policy. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, I'm gonna explain it in just a minute, but it won't make any sense unless I tell you about what happened on Halloween of 2008. Weird, I know. It was on this night, amidst a global financial crisis, that an anonymous coder was about to publish a document that has had central bankers shaking in their boots ever since. The document, titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, marked the beginning of a seismic shift in the world's understanding of money. And the invention it described was about to become the best performing asset in the world for the next decade. Although its growth is unlike anything we've seen in recent times, Many still consider its price movements to be too big, too fast, and too random to consider investing. But what if I told you that every major rally and crash of Bitcoin has not only been entirely predictable, but has stuck to a script outlined by this equation since its inception in 2009. The one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B, without A knowing B or B knowing A. It's not a. controlled. The whole, the whole Bitcoin market is about a billion dollars. It's a novelty yeah. for the geek squad. It has quintupled in value over the last year. Just just since the, the Cyprus thing came up, it's up over 20%. Bitcoins is digital money. If you're looking at this right now, you're looking at it from some type of digital device. Everything is going digital. Bitcoin, the original cryptocurrency, was worth $1,000 per Bitcoin at the beginning of this year but it is now priced at about $2,600. Kobe, to explain exactly how Bitcoin's recent rally and crash was because of that equation, we first need to head back to before digital money was anything other than just a cool idea in the heads of a bunch of shadowy super coders. Before this document was published, nobody thought digital money was possible. And it's not like nobody was trying either. There was many attempts at digital money before Bitcoin, but none of them were successful. Why is that? Well, I'll just show you. So here is my totally legit digital money. I have one. Yeah, copy and paste is the problem. Now it's quite intuitive that this is an issue when you're creating digital money because you only really need to understand one thing to understand why this is a problem. And that's that money is a claim on value. Humans began to use money so that we could trade at any time. Before this, we relied on barter, which was much less efficient. And unless two parties who wanted to trade with each other each had something that the other one wanted, then this trade would be impossible. This problem was known as the coincidence of wants. Money solved this. Instead of trading value, we could just trade for these claims on value that everybody would always want at all times. So long as you had enough money or enough of these claims on value, you could trade with anybody. You didn't have to have something that they wanted from you. But for this to actually work, we need to limit the amount of claims on value that there are. Otherwise, we'll end up with more claims on value than value to be claimed. And the claims on value will become worthless. It's no good having digital money if people can just duplicate it. There were a lot of attempts at fixing this problem, but explaining exactly where they all went wrong can get a little technical, so I'll just give like the basic overview. Other attempts at digital money were set up in such a way that they would give one person complete control and authority over how much new money gets issued. When I say money, I'm not talking dollars or pounds or anything, I'm talking about the form of digital currency that they were trying to invent. This was supposedly a way to prevent counterfeiting. And I guess it works in theory, but it just had like a major problem, which is that it centralizes power. If only one person has the power to create new money, then in the words of Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. Now, but seriously, having one person responsible for the integrity of the entire currency creates a lot of risk in one place. It's a singular point of failure, which makes the entire project very unstable. Satoshi's solution was to allow everyone to create new Bitcoin, just not for free and not without limits. God, I don't know why I crumpled it up. This equation is actually the rules of Bitcoin creation, and it's hardwired into the Bitcoin code. And it limits the amount of Bitcoin that can ever be created to 21 million, so there will never be more than that. This all does relate to Bitcoin's price, I promise. Now, I'll admit, when I first heard about this, I was kind of confused because I thought, if that's all there is to the whole thing, then why don't you get rid of the whole complicated equation and just have it be 21 million? Basically, why all the fancy math? Well, 
Bitcoin is still being created, the all 21 million of them don't actually exist yet. And that equation dictates how many Bitcoins will be created every 10 minutes until the 21 millionth Bitcoin has been created in like the year 2140. In this part of the equation, there's a division bit, 50 over 2i. All this is saying is to cut the speed of Bitcoin creation in half every four years. And we call these four year periods a halving cycle. This means every four years, the speed that new Bitcoins are being created and entering the market is getting cut in half. It's been 14 years since the first Bitcoins were ever mined. And so we're into our fourth halving cycle. This means that Bitcoin is currently being created at a rate of 6.25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. This new Bitcoin is issued within blocks, which are just lists of recent Bitcoin transactions that are added to the blockchain every 10 minutes. And since the blockchain is publicly available, we can actually check this ourselves by looking at a recently mined block. But what does all this actually mean for the price of Bitcoin? Well, we've got to consider one of the most fundamental laws of economics, which is supply and demand. The idea of supply and demand is pretty simple. It says that there are two forces that determine the price of a good. Supply, how much stuff is there to buy? And demand, how many people want to buy it? High demand means that sellers can get away with charging more. And high supply means that sellers have to be more competitive with their prices in order to attract the demand. And the balance of those two forces is how prices are arrived at. But there's a catch, kind of. The rule actually applies to money itself. Money is a product that serves a purpose. And like any other product, it's subject to the laws of supply and demand. If you create too much money, as we mentioned earlier, the value of that money will decrease. You cannot simply add real value to the world by issuing more claims on value. You could add an extra zero to every banknote in the world, for instance, and technically you would have increased the supply of money by 10 times, but that doesn't mean everybody's 10 times wealthier. Nothing will have actually changed in the material world. But unfortunately, history is littered with countless stories of countries printing their currency into the ground. Even the United States dollar, the currency upon which the global economy operates has lost 95% of its value in the past 100 years, and the rate at which it's losing value is increasing. But there's limits to the amount of dollars that can be created, right? Well, no. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's the gold standard of... I'll just show you. Money was valued in reference to the gold standard. Gold is no longer used in this way, though it is still valuable. So the term has taken on a looser meaning. The gold standard of something is simply a great or excellent example. A gold standard is the best of the best. So what was this monetary system, the name of which is now literally used to describe the best of the best of something? The gold standard was a period of time where money was actually claims on gold, and you could go to the bank at any time and redeem that money for gold. This made it so that currencies never lost their value by limiting the amount of money that could be created to the amount of gold that the central bank had to back it up. That was until 1971, when Richard Nixon severed the tie of what remained of the gold standard and in the process completely removed the limits of the money printer. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The dollar has lost 88% of its value since that announcement by Richard Nixon. 88%. Just to clarify, if you were to have held on to your dollars for the past 50 years, you would only be able to buy a tenth of what you originally could with them. And much of this was because the rate at which the dollar was being printed was going up over time. So not only was more being printed, but the speed it was being printed was increasing. But the speed that Bitcoin is being created is decreasing. It's literally being cut in half every four years. So, price. This is a chart of Bitcoin's price history. And despite being down around 80% from its all time high, it still paints a very optimistic picture. See, Bitcoin tends to have a fun little party trick where every four years, its price will increase by multiples, run out of steam, and then come falling by 80%, give or take. 
Are these lines mark the dates of each of the Bitcoin halvings that we've experienced so far? Here we can see the effect that the Bitcoin's halving cycle has on the price quite clearly. This is pretty incredible because even if we suppose that the demand for Bitcoin never budged, the halving cycle will be a constant upward pressure on the price regardless. And as more and more Bitcoin lands in the hands of diamond hand hodlers that will not give up their Bitcoin for anything, the effective supply of Bitcoin is actually only going to shrink over time. Not to mention the Bitcoin that gets lost and whatnot. Ever since Halloween of 2008, Bitcoin's price has been destined to follow this script. And it's still spooking people out of the market to this day. But see the bigger picture, sometimes all you've got to do is zoom out. <laughs> if you want to look into some of the topics that I mentioned in this video, I'll put some links in the description of like useful learning resources and stuff that I think would really be complementary to the types of stuff that we talked about here because although I try to get as much in as possible, it's a short video and the topics that I'm talking about, you could spend hours and hours and hours going into them. So if you want to learn more about the halving cycle or about how it's enforced or the consensus or any of these things, I'll put a link for each of those topics that I think could be beneficial. This will be the first of many weekly videos with the goal of making Bitcoin understandable. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss any future uploads that we do. Um, and thank you for watching. Gotta clean up all this paper.